Thank you, Sal, and uh, make it a good weekend, friend. I'll, and thanks for the, uh, the fancy introduction. I have to say, friends, a little different than one I had gotten not too long ago. I, I had arrived behind schedule, and in a play on words, I was introduced as the late Mark Schweiker, <laughs> Sal. So um, I appreciate that very thoughtful, that, those very thoughtful remarks, and uh, great to see everyone. I've been a guest of the league many, many times, and you know, as a former township supervisor, no surprise, you kind of, you know, once a local official as far as mentality, it's not, a, it's not a perspective that you release or diminish, as Dennis, I think, emphasized as well in, in his remarks. But so if I could, I just want to take a quick privilege here to mention uh, a good friend, a supporter. Uh, you mentioned uh, John Brenner, but, uh, you know, he's had a tough year. You know, he had a dad who was a, a member of borough council, volunteer firefighter, uh, president of the Pennsylvania VFW, a decorated uh, military veteran, and I know the Pennsylvania Guard has a big honor awaiting him later in the year. So if you would, big round of applause in, in memory of John Brenner's dad, uh, who, you got it, John. I know the Brenners, I knew his dad, and I, I know what 2019, uh, unfortunately brought for the family. So I'm glad I could offer that reflection and you're so kind to, to underscore your fondness for the, you know, the Brenner contribution to community well-being, which I think all of this uh, take to heart. You know, uh, Sal mentioned uh, my background and, and I'll probably, I should mention we had a great conversation last night at dinner and you know, people often, and it's nice, it, Believe me, friends, I, to this moment, I feel great pride in having the opportunity and the role and the obligation to serve as Pennsylvania's governor or lieutenant governor for 12 million Pennsylvanians. But to a great extent, you know, and this, this aspect of your identity doesn't shift. I mean, I was an eight-year township supervisor. I was a seven-year county commissioner. I was elected and re-elected to both. And, you know, I, as I said last night, I wasn't more than seven days away from a public meeting and you'll know the significance of this remark and the pressure of this remark. I wasn't more than seven days away from a public meeting for 15 years, except for like July and August. You know, you kind of back it off a little bit. And I say that because we were under the development gun. We had a big mall come in in Bucks County. I was a Bucks County commissioner. And then, so it was, it was demanding. And you don't finish that stretch in life uh, without it really guaranteeing that you're perspective and your sensitivity will forever be, whether you are with gubernatorial authority or other authority, what you remember about that work. And I'll throw a couple of things at you that I think are time eternal. One, especially as this ugliness that we see in the federal government, uh, you know, metastasize and move across Pennsylvania into communities and across the country, how about this? When you look at the Gallup poll data for the 16th straight year, you know who they trust the most? Not the members of Congress, not those who might serve in Harrisburg in the, in the, on the legislative side. It's you. Local officials, their sense of faith, their sense of hope, their, fen their sense of trust. It doesn't ebb. You've got special rank and responsibility. Second, I'll say this to you, is that when you take that oath, they go home that night and think, man, I hope he or she takes that seriously. We're counting on you, so to speak. That they may not voice that to you. They are making the mental leap that you are faith-filled about that. The third element is this. I'll bet my bottom dollar, and it doesn't change, and Sal certainly is a veteran, of the local government process as well. And every one of the speakers, whether it was Gene or Dennis or Sal or your executive director have talked about what I think is numero uno and it usually doesn't fall off that figurative list. Maybe up there with job creation and economic development. Public safety, neighborhood security. They may not come to you every day and say this or be insistent or strident about it, but with that faith in mind and just their hope and trust in you, they hope you get it. And I say this because 
I feel like for me it was such a tremendous advantage to have that local government background. You know, I was raised in a steel town. Uh, you know, to this day, you know, this is not meant to be a comparative remark, I, I was raised in a place where, you know, to this day they'll tell you they think Roosevelt did more for them than Reagan ever did. You, you get my point. I'm not, it's not a comparative remark. Just, just the way I was raised politically. And so, you know, you bring that kind of sensitivity and to your work in local government, and it's not about ideology and politics, am I right? I mean, water and sewer problems. Is there a Republican, a Democratic approach? Is getting rid of the opioid abuse and addiction problem something that's Republican or Democrat? Of course not. And so you kind of bring a very practical, can-do approach to your everyday effort, whether as lieutenant governor and governor uh, in the administration of public service and government. And I bring this up because as I was competing and I, and I thought to myself, man, I, I gotta have really concrete ideas about education system improvements. And I gotta have really concrete ideas about corrections and probation and parole and aging services for older Pennsylvanians. And I thought I did, I think Tom Ridge and I did, and we did some good work. If you would have told me during my staging years, I called them in the mid-90s when Tom and I were talking about we'd like the honor and, and the shot at leading Pennsylvania, and, I, and someone said to me, yeah, but how about this, man? You're going to wake up one beautiful Tuesday, and one of the bloodiest days in the history of the country will occur on your watch, and by 10 o'clock, United Flight 93, having left Newark, would turn around over, our, uh, in, over Ohio, catch a little bit of West Virginia and crash into Shanksville. You will face that. And I, I would have said, you're crazy. That, that's, that, that stuff doesn't happen. If they had said to me, yeah, you're gonna get a call one summer night, which Sal mentioned, and hey, we're looking for 18 minors, Governor. They're 18, we all remember nine, the whole nine for nine slogan, so to speak. And we were, there were 18 at the time when I first had to head west to, to back to Somerset County, which incredibly so, ironically, was only just a short distance from where United Flight 93 crashed into the ground upside down at 560 miles per hour and killed, you know, all 40 passengers and crew. You remember this stuff. I, no one, uh, no one I, I encounter uh, has forgotten where they were that day or, or how that went down. But the point is this, friends, as we gather today, uh, I would have said you were crazy and, and these things happened. So let me look you in the eye and say, you are going to face some kind of high stakes, perhaps life or death challenge. Maybe not you per se, but one of you in the proverbial sense. They are the probabilities. And so when John asked about, would I come out and talk a little bit? I said, happy to. I, I have great regard and appreciation for what you do on an everyday, every minute basis. I look at the program, friends. You know what this program says? It shouts at you. It shouts at you. Are you ready? Topically. Secu cyber security. Communications during high stress moments. How's your fire department doing? They're key first responders. My dad once said to me, I cannot imagine you doing a good job without the key people in the, in the municipal apparatus you know, ambulance, fire, and PD, not believing you've got the right perspective. You've got to nail that constituency down first. I believe that, by the way. I still believe that to this day. I hope you do, too. And I bring this up because this, this agenda screams at you. And this is why, as professionally dedicated folks, we gather. Are you ready? Is your government ready? When I went west that day, to some extent, I was prayerful and, and looking back on the foundational experience of which I mentioned just a few moments ago as a township supervisor and a county commissioner that I had that background. Where we deploy, I often would say to legislators, man, listen, state government doesn't tell lo what lo lo local government should do in a crisis. State government sends very little equipment, maybe technical and intellectual help, 
I mean, technically speaking, your fire chief is the site commander. And I would ask you rhetorically, do you have your EMC in, in place, which by Pennsylvania statute, every jurisdiction should have an emergency management coordinator of some talent and dedication. I bring this up because as I, as I headed uh, that day out to uh, the crash site, and often I hear the word carnage, and I would assure you, friends, uh, carnage is too cute of a word. There was nothing left. When you go in at that speed, upside down, they're, they're probably, well, there was nothing left. Maybe the skin, the metal skin of the plane as big as that table. Pieces of leather of a wallet. This was, this was not carnage, this was evisceration. And I, as I, I had to think this morning as I, as I took a quick walk through beautiful Gettysburg, 1,400 miles from here, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed still lives who perpetrated this, this ugly attack and brought about the demise and the deaths of 3,000 people. And he sits in Guantanamo Bay still breathing. Yet, we took care of Osama bin Laden, tip of, hat to, tip of the hat to President Obama and the, uh, the Navy SEAL team that took him out. And yet, we stand here on this gorgeous Friday and I wonder, what about justice? What about those 3,000 kids who lost parents and Khalid Sheikh Mohammed still breathes? That is not justice. And I bring this up to make the point as I went there, there that day that we had a profound obligation to the families, many of whom we did meet. Uh, last year I was a, a special guest of the families of Flight 93 along with President Trump uh, to be, to offer some keynotes as we dedicated the tower voices, which is 93 foot tall with 40 uh, chimes, which forever say, look at the patriots who perished here and don't forget them. But I believe we were able to ably and sensibly and operationally manage that site along with the FBI, because in this country, the FBI handles crisis management and the state government handles consequence management. That's under the, what's called the Nunn-Lugar Act. And we very carefully did our work. If you think of some of the YouTube videos you've seen, you'll remember seeing the firefight, the volunteer firefighters led by FBI agents and Pennsylvania State Police and very tr uh, sophisticated volunteers walking across the site, looking down on, into the dirt, looking for these fine pieces of what were evidence that would allow us to successfully prosecute. I bring that up because all that I experienced in local government was brought to bear. I'll, be, I'll give you a case in point. Job one, when you have a major challenge or a major issue, a, a, a active shooter in your high school, God forbid. Job one, you cordon off the site. It's called establishing a site perimeter. Very rural area in that section of Somerset County. You look closely, you see the Pennsylvania State Police Mounted Unit establishing the perimeter. In other words, we were working together in shared command with the FBI. My comfort in committing that was a direct result of the kind of experience that you and I have every day where residents who are nearby, you're gonna see them at the dry cleaners, you're gonna see them at the restaurant, you're gonna see them in the park. They want quick action, they want quick solutions, am I right? That mentality is what I think helped fuel a very able response. And the fact that I talked with the coroner of Somerset County, a local official, and say, listen, very quickly, uh, we have got to uh, garner the Pennsylvania National Guard armory there, and that has to be in your care and your administration uh, as we set up that large mortuary, because we lost everyone that day. So, I bring that up because uh, I, I do believe it gave me a sense of perspective and intense dedication that we got the job done. And most in law enforcement, I think, universally would say that Pennsylvania did the job uh, during the, the, those horrific times. But we lost everybody. So if everyone, anyone involved in emergency response kind of taps their heart, they know that one of the real big kicks in emergency response is you want to help 
you, you want to aid, you want to assist. There was no one to assist. They were dead, all dead. The, the wonderful emotional aspect of what happened when we returned to Somerset County, ironically, for the mine rescue is that all lived. It's the only time in the history of American mining where all nine miners were found who were trapped and brought up successfully. It's just the, the one and only time. There are 18 miners, and I bring that up because for many of us, motivated by that assistance and, 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 and capable emergency response, the idea is we, we kind of write at the emotional ledger. All had lived. But you think about some of the foundational experiences, again, that were brought to bear during what was 80 hours, just 80 hours, in, in Shanksville. Again, grounded in what you and I were expected to habitually, easily execute and accomplish as local government officials. Get on the job. Executive presence. I remember waking the governor of West Virginia. Uh, we needed a particular sophisticated piece of equipment on a truck, a compressor, and this will make a little bit of sense uh, when I talk, when mention, uh, when we kind of go over how we, the rescue there. But I said, Governor, I, 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 I feel so bad at having to wake you, but you've got this piece of equipment we need. And more than that, I'd like you to make sure the West Virginia State Police run point for this equipment, because it's massive, because we need to be able to sh shove down into that mine a couple hundred feet down this hot compressed air, because we think we know where they are now, in order to give them that life-saving oxygen. Not fun when you say, Gov, listen, you need to put that, that state police unit in front and back because you need to get them up to about 75 miles per hour. We don't have a lot of time. And I guarantee you when you hit the Pennsylvania border, our team, will, our PSP crew will be ready. And I, I still hear from people who saw that massive truck go by at 75 miles per hour and think, wow. But time was of the essence. It was truly life and death. We wanted the accent on life. And so... The, the, the point is the, the shared response, the shared management, the, the shared command, which is so important when an incident overwhelms local authorities and it's going to happen. And so what it meant, this was not an insignificant pursuit, Sal. This was, this was the first of three times that we were successful in helping these miners avoid the ugly fate that they thought was theirs and had already written notes to their loved ones that were going to be checking out and left those notes in their lunch boxes. Yet, lo and behold, we dropped that six inch air pipe down there, bingo, right on them, and Mark Popernick, who, with whom I've gotten to be good friends, one of the miners said, you almost knocked my damn helmet off. <laughs> That's how close we were. But it, it, it's filled up that cavern with this, kind of created a life-saving bubble that held back the water and gave them oxygen because they were breathing like this. <laughs> That's that's six hours after the water incursion had occurred. And then, if you remember, just the, this, this marshalling of every pump, large and small, to start sucking out the water, that was gubernatorial prerogative, much as the Governor Wolf would do. The idea is, given my background, I was not interested in offering pretty pleases to anyone. We will use your equipment, we will send guard personnel, we'll be there in 60 minutes, you need to stand aside if you cannot participate in this. This is life and death. Second way, so to speak, where they were saved, then the third, you remember when they were brought up one by one by one on that Sunday morning. And through it all, the Shanksville Fire Department, uh, a local responder, a, a, a key participant in, in taking care of the families because that's where the families were. We not only cordoned off the site for where the rescue was, which was below the Arnold Farm in Lincoln Township. We had cordoned off also the firehouse uh, where the families were. So I really believe that, that our perspective, and my first team was very dedicated. We wanted that one after losing everybody months earlier on 9-11. This is one we wanted. So let me finish with this. Uh, I'll finish this way. The point of all of this is that you're not gonna get an email that says, Mother Nature's coming your way. Get ready for flooding. You're not gonna get an email 
when there's a train derailment and you've got to cordon off a site maybe five, six miles wide and send state police or your local police in to say, you've got noxious air coming your way. Really, in a proverbial sense, the question I'm raising is, are you ready, as I said a couple of minutes ago? You know, that comment, uh, Noah didn't wait till it started raining before he built the ark. I'm not saying you're going to go out and build an ark. You, you get the point. And I'll finish this way. And this is, uh, having done a few of these, and I did a program with the mayor of Littleton, Colorado, home to Columbine High School. And probably, and this is, you know, a very unattractive comparison, but I'm trying to make a point here, probably the first, you know, infamous active shooter incident in a U.S. high school when those two killers went in and took out, I believe, 12 kids and one teacher. So the mayor had confided in me, and this says something about your, your poise and your preparation, not just your planning. One implies activity and execution and field work. One implies passivity and tabletop only. He said to me, hmm, you know what I really find interesting after all these years? That parents come up to me and they never have forgotten that the FBI response team showed up with some county SWAT people and the parents were so close because they had not established a site perimeter. If you remember, the parents were very close to the building that day, even though there was an active shooter with automatic, automatic weapons inside. They could hear apparently the FBI agents introducing themselves to each other for the first time. In other words, they didn't know each other. No rapport, no poise, no unit, no team. Think about it. And so the mayor said to me, what do you think, Gov? Are you confident or less confident when you come to know that? I said, of course, Mayor, you're less confident. They're going to go in, and if you would take a look at the after action report, they had old uh, blueprints. Frank DeAngelis, the principal, was hiding. Uh, they just couldn't get to him. What's the relevance to you? I mean, you're leaders in your community, members of council and mayors. Do you have the phone number, mobile phone number for all of your colleagues and your top administrative executives? Do you have the mobile phone number for your EMC? Do you have the mobile phone number for your top county emergency management official? It's not going to wait. You know, this, this isn't, it's going to come at you very, very quickly in shocking, high stakes ways. Hopefully, you don't face this. But I'm looking around this room, probabilities are somebody's going to have to face this down. I certainly didn't think it was going to be the case. So I bring up Columbine to make this point because I'm a big believer in. Not the keynotes about being practic practical, implementable actions. So is it only plan, plan, plan? I don't believe so, friends. I think that suggests a passivity and kind of an ignorance as to how X-factor dynamics will present themselves in challenges. It is plan, 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 but very importantly, as the mayor of Little and I had concluded, practice, practice, practice. Does your high school principal even know your police chief? Do you have accurate blueprints? Has your EMC ever been in the high school? Do you practice together? As they say, do you play together? And I mean that in a serious way. That is preparedness. That is poise. Now, I know you're ready. Individually, you took the oath. Remember, that's how I had begun. You know, the oath, the oath means I'm taking this one seriously. And public safety, neighborhood security is at the top of that list. Now, you're either emotionally gone, and it doesn't mean anything to you, or that oath, impressive and meant to be suggestive of your 24 and 7 commitment, exists. Now, what do you do? 
My suggestion, friends, is you think about the soft skills that are required here and the kind of manageable time you can give it to knit together, perhaps, a shared response. Because Mother Nature, whether it's floods, uh, you name it, in fact, our, my daughter at one time was so young, she saw me in some of these settings and often said, Dad, you're like the disaster guy. And I said, I don't know if that helps me in terms of monikers and labels, but you get the point. It's not going to ask, these challenges will not ask your permission. They're going to come at you in the most unexpected form, and I would suggest for some of you probably in, in the months to come. So, uh, are you Noah? It's something you've got to ask yourself. Try to build the ark before the rain comes. Nice to see everyone.